This is um, in celebration of Black History Month, but of course as a transfer we try to celebrate history no matter of ethnicity at any time. But today we're talking about a wonderful history link that is dear to our own community. It's the connection of the um, Gullah Geechee connection from the island of Barbados and the great state of South Carolina. Um, just talking with our, our guest speaker today, I learned a lot about maybe some connections that I didn't even have with the island of Barbados. So I am very excited, and I am sure you'll find out some additional information as she talks to you. We have as our special guest, Ms. Rhoda Green, who is the founder and president of the Barbados and the Carolina Legacy Foundation. And this program is sponsored in connection with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. And there's some folks here from that organization that you'll also meet as well before the, the, the presentation is over. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Rhoda Green. And she also, I think, has a special presentation of someone that's a special guest with us today from yes. the island of Barbados. Yes, Please yes. welcome her. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings to everyone. Uh, I am also the honorary, con uh, the honorary Consul for Barbados in South Carolina. And I work under the oversight of the consulate in Miami. Our Consul General is newly installed and he happens to be here in Charleston to get an understanding and to feel the vibes, the Barbadian vibes, which are all over. He's here to find out what is the interest? Why is there so much history and so much inquiry into the Barbados Carolina connection? So we were and are lucky and fortunate to have our Consul General who oversees the southeastern states of the United, of the United States. And uh, he's here, I would like to introduce him to you and he can say a few words. His name is Consul General Neville Greenwich. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Honorary Council. Colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, everyone. Let me say what a pleasure it is to be with you here in South Carolina this morning. And not only a pleasure to be with you, but to be able to speak with you briefly about our beautiful country, Barbados. And even though, like you, I'm learning more about the Carolinas Barbados connection, I am fully aware of the great links that we have had um, between the nation Barbados and this and this um, state here, or this city for that matter, over the last couple hundred years. Um, the history is rich, um, and I must say that. You guys here have been fortunate to have such a relentless servant um, who has for the last probably 30 years been fighting the battle uh, to improve not only the connections between the two parties, but to ensure that you here in the Carolinas learn about Barbados and that your interest becomes so great that you in turn will go down to Barbados, and in my case, I would say come down to Barbados, <laughs> and learn of the connection from the other end. So let me say to you that right here, apart from seeing it as a morning where you're going to learn, I also want to invite you to come down to Barbados and, and share the experience that you will not normally be able to get here in South Carolina because it is a totally different feeling when you come to the other side of the world. So I want to welcome you to Barbados. The other thing about it is that, and let me say as well, 
Only yesterday evening, our new, well, six months ago, she became Prime Minister of Barbados, the very first woman to be named Prime Minister, to become Prime Minister of Barbados. And you can do the research on a wonderful, highly intellectual, uh, extremely smart woman who is now our Prime Minister by the name of Mia Amar Motley. Um, you should do the research. I'm sure she will welcome anything that you want to go to her um, Facebook page or you want to go to her Instagram or any of her social media feeds. You can speak with her. Um, as she's one of the most caring and daring and charming persons you could ever want. And she'd be more than happy to know that the people in the Carolinas are, are welcoming her to the Carolinas at some time. So feel free to, to reach out to her um, in social media, and I can tell you that she responds, and she does it in person. But only yesterday evening, she launched what we in Barbados are extremely proud of as an initiative called the Gathering 2020. You can also go to the um, website. You can see it on the Facebook page as well, where Sometime last year, just around our independence, around the uh, 30th of November, she told us that there was going to be something special coming, an initiative that she had. And earlier in the year, she announced that she's going to be inviting all Barbadians, their friends, their families, and their offspring, whether you're first generation, second generation, or in some cases, even third generation or fourth because she understands the value of the diaspora to the development of our country. And even though the diaspora has been making a relatively significant contribution to the development of Barbados over the years, she thinks that there is so much more that can be done from the diaspora um, and the offspring of the first generation Barbadians. And so she wants to ensure that you are treated with the courtesy and that whatever you do, is the appreciation is shown and that all your acts of kindness are really appreciated. And so she has invited all Barbadians back to Barbados, wherever they are around the globe next year. And she launched the initiative globally yesterday evening. Now, for you here in the Carolinas, I just heard somebody say that there are Gibbs. <laughs> and I can tell you that the Gibbs family in Barbados is huge. In fact, I even went to school with some Gibbs, and those Gibbs were the white Gibbs. There was a family called James Gibbs, and there is one who played for the world famous Merry Men as well. Um, his name isn't coming back to me now. His first name isn't coming back. Is he to Roger? Me. Roger Gibbs, yeah. And then there is another one that's living in Toronto that is highly a very cultural guy that did a lot of work with us with the Barbados Tourism Authority. Um, and then I also know we have a consul, one of our senior members of staff in Toronto right now who has gone there just over a month ago, six weeks ago. Um, he is also, now he is a black gives so that you have, and the thing about Barbados is this, the, 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 the whole thing about the cultural aspect of Barbados is that, and this is why we, we have no regard for racism in our country, because you will find that just two generations ago, your grandfather, three generations ago, your grandfather would have been Irish or white. And he might have had a, a black wife, and that generation became dark, and then that one married somebody darker. But just three generations ago, your ancestors can be traced as white, and in most cases, from Irish. So that, that we have absolutely no tolerance whatsoever in our country for racism, because we know that all of us in that small country have very close connections especially with either Africa or the Irish, um, when, when you trace it back. So that we welcome all of you to Barbados. And this morning, 
the exercise which come, Honorary Council Green um, continues to, uh, I mean, she continues to work, like I said, tirelessly promoting our country. And it is therefore a distinct pleasure of mine this morning to congratulate her on her continued work and offer my support wherever I can as long as I'm in the position as the Consul General for Barbados at Miami. And as she said, the southeastern part of the US, which goes all the way from Texas and includes the Carolinas, uh, Kentucky, all the way to Florida, Louisiana, all those states um, fall under the ambit of the Consul General at Miami. And wherever we are, when it comes to making events like these tourism events, it, this is my distinct pleasure to do it. And this in itself is a tourism event, even though it is a learning event this morning, because we wouldn't want you to just come and learn about it. We want you to understand that the Galigichi people would have, in many instances, can be traced back to Barbados. And so you want to come down there to see where your ancestors would have traveled 300 years ago, 400 years ago. It's real. And many of the plantations down there, even a plantation called Davis Plantation in St. Peter. Um, a lot of the names that I see on the signpost here, many of them are Barbadians. The streets are from Barbados. So that Come and live, relive that kind of experience in the real situation in our country. And we'd be more than happy to welcome you to Barbados. And I can say, if you want to do it next year, <laughs> you'll even be welcome twice. <laughs> but I would want you to come once this year and once next year so that you would earn your two welcomes. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you, and I, I'm sure that today will be a very educational, a very informative day, and if at any time you want to switch to ask me anything, um, if I don't know, I will call Barbados and ask for you. <laughs> <laughs> so have a great day, ladies and gentlemen. I forgot to say a very special hello to my friend Robert in the back. You must excuse me, Robert, because you know I always, I'm a feminist, so. <laughs> <laughs> so have a great day, and, and do enjoy the session, and I, I want again to look forward to welcoming you or any of my friends from the Barbados Tourism Management in Barbados, welcoming you to Barbados. And if you're going down there, make sure you let Ms. Rhoda know who will tell me we have some friends who were in that very special session on that Saturday morning going down to Barbados. So we can get a red carpet ready for you and not only a red sweater. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a great day, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna put on my presentation hat. And I don't want to spend any time talking about me, but I want to talk about the history that we share. An interesting thing happened to me just recently. I was talking to a lady who her ancestors worked on the Middleton Plantation. And Middleton did a documentary that has gotten rave reviews. It's now being shown nationwide. But it was all based on the Middleton's connection to Barbados and then to South Carolina and Middleton Place Foundation, as it is now, an icon for plantations and for visitors. So this lady told me, you were featured, you were one of the people featured on this video, on this documentary, which has won uh, a gold award within that category of documentaries. And she said, she lives in New York, and she said, when you gave the presentation, I saw in you a teacher. Now, I taught for a short while 
when I graduated in Barbados before coming to the US. But I never thought of this kind of interaction, I never thought of it as being a teacher. But I said, okay, I'll put that hat on and I will use that because I taught for a short while. But let's get to the topic that we are talking about. Many people don't know the historical link between Barbados and the Carolinas, or why there's a link at all, or why, 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 do, why, why do people even talk about Barbados? Because in the minds of many people, if they hear a little accent, and if they don't recognize it, they ask, are you from Jamaica? Or are you from anywhere else? They don't have any idea of Barbados. So I want to show you and talk a little bit about Barbados and the Carolinas, because historians have all been doing lots of research. And these are some of the things they have said about Barbados. They call the Carolinas a colony of a colony. The colony, Carolina, is a colony of Barbados, which was one of the British first colonies. It became the hub for British expansion in the, in, 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 in the Western world. And even though there was a movement of people coming from Europe and going to Virginia and some of the northern states, the connection between Barbados and the Carolinas, the connections are so very defining that it created a different type of community. So here's a picture of Barbados. It is a small island, 166 square miles. It sits out in the Atlantic. There is an archipelago of islands that stretch from the beginning, the tip of Florida, and it extends all the way down to South America. An archipelago is kind of a chain of islands. So if you look at the map, just to orient yourself, that is what we're talking about. And the most easterly of those islands is Barbados, a small island sitting out in the Atlantic. Now here's what was going on that occasioned this big connection. The British, along with all of the other colonial powers at that time, they were looking for more colonies. They were looking for places to settle. When the English settled in Barbados in 1627, they experimented with the type of crops that they were looking for because they were coming from a feudal system where they were familiar with planting and reaping and growing uh, produce. And so they settled in Barbados and they experimented with some of the very crops that were experimented on here in Virginia and the Southeast. It wasn't until some Jewish people trying to escape the Inquisition, they landed in Barbados. And it was these Brazilian Jews who introduced sugar. Well, that happened and the whole world changed. Everything changed because sugar became the product that made Barbados stand out. And from that situation, Barbados had first started to get people from Ireland, Scotland, from Wales. The British got those people as indentured servants. Some of them were kidnapped. Some of them were shipped to Barbados because they had committed 
crime, sometimes small crime, not big crime, but yeah, they were shipped to Barbados. And this term came about to be Barbados. That meant being sent to hell on earth. And so that was the workforce that Barbados used. But when sugar came and they realized that they needed a big, massive workforce, they decided, OK, West Africa. And so masses of West Africans were enslaved and brought to Barbados to work on the sugar plantations. And it was there that that whole system called the plantation system or the plantocracy became active and vibrant. And here's where our story actually begins in terms of making the linkage. Barbados, this small island, was quickly, over a decade, deforested. And what you had was plantations. Some records say that there were between five, 700, even 1,000 plantations all over the island. There was only one spot of land that was left in its natural form. But everywhere else on the island, it is relatively flat. It kind of rises in plateaus. And on that little island, plantations popped up everywhere. But it was the British's policy that the oldest child would get land or would get what the father or the parents were able to bequeath to them. The younger ones, there was, if it's not enough, they didn't get it. So it was in the 1670s, 1669, there was a proclamation made in Barbados. It was called the Barbados Proclamation. And that proclamation called for anyone, particularly the British or the, the, those who, who uh, were working on the island, uh, forced labor, or those who were looking for opportunities, they had this proclamation read, and they actually uh, invited people to kind of sign up. And so they signed up in droves, and they came to the Carolinas. Uh, the first expedition landed in Cape Fear, around the Wilmington area. That didn't go too well. And later, the second try, the one that really actually took root was the settlement that landed in Charleston, at around where Charleston Landing is. But that is kind of a quick overview. The story is so dense, and there's so many layers to it that it is hard to do it within a short period of time. So what I'm doing is I'm skimming the surface, and I'm just giving you some sort of connectivity so that you'd be able to understand the backdrop. It isn't full. It isn't a whole lot. What we are talking about is tapping into your roots. So the history is there. Some people don't like history. There is another part of that that is now coming to the fro, genealogy. Ms. Gibbs, this is where you would come in. <laughs> genealogy. Genealogy and history are almost like opposite sides of a coin. Because when you look into someone's genealogy, you have to look back into history. Because our ancestors were alive, and they were living, and they were either working on Middleton Plantation or some other plantation. And so history is important as a backdrop to understand our genealogy. So what I want us to do, let's approach it from this point. History tells a big story, but you have a story, I have a story. And we know very well that as the story was told, 
the colonial powers, the planters and those people, they actually are the ones who were noted. But our ancestors, they weren't noted. They were considered in many instances as beasts of burden. They were the labor force. And so on a given plantation, what they were supposed to do is to do the work and from sun up to sundown, they had to suffer a lot of the, 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 the hardship. But they were silent, they were faceless. And today we are finding out. So what I want us to do, I want you to use your mind and come, come take a little journey with me. Because what we want to do is as we go through here tapping into our roots, we are doing what our ancestors probably can't or couldn't do. We are going to invade the space of the plantations. And we are going to find out, we are going to see what we can find out about those families and the relationships they had with the enslaved people. And what I want us to do mentally is to own that space. Yes, you don't have a plantation. You don't have something erected in your honor, but your ancestors occupied and worked in the spaces of plantations everywhere, both in Barbados and in the Carolinas. And it is somewhat empowering if in our generation we can go back and we can claim our ancestors space and learn things that we never knew and they can pretty much further inspire us in 2020 or 2019 in our time, in our generation. So let's kind of go on this trip. One of the things I want us to know is that when the settlers came from Barbados, and there were many, I'm going to kind of rush through this because, gosh, I don't have a whole lot, so I'm going to kind of pretty much go through it quickly. What the planters learned and transplanted here to the Carolinas, it became the infrastructure for society, for the society that developed here. So anywhere, everywhere you go in South Carolina, when you look at the architecture, that architecture reflects connections to Barbados. When you look at the art, that art reflects that connection, shared influences. The people, yes, they were the British, they were the indentured servants, and we'll go through this quickly. Uh, and then they were the African uh, enslaved people. They were all part of that big history. They were part of the history. And they were making that history just as much as the colonial powers were. Without the enslaved people, history would be different. We wouldn't be talking about places like Middleton and Drayton Hall and Magnolia because you would have a different configuration. We'd be talking about a different history. So the people of enslaved uh, areas from West Africa, their role and the place they occupied in that developing society, the settlement, was as vital as that of the big colonists, the merchants and the traders. So in a general way, the people, we can talk about that. Any and each one of these can take a whole lesson or whole uh, discourse. But yes, when we talk about food, we talk about fashion, we talk about music, we talk about religion, we talk about the government, we talk about the plantation, yes, the politics, the economy, the trade, the laws, the trades, yes, and uh, the, the military uh, aspect of maintaining these new settlements, and piracy. And one of the things that I didn't put on this when I did it several years ago was genealogy. So let's walk through quickly 
tapping into your roots. So here what we are doing, we are invading the spaces of the planters. And we are trying to find out things that were never passed on to us. We are trying to kind of recoup our identity. It was stripped in many ways. We were perceived as only beast of burden. And I say we because I'm a descendant also of ancestors who were enslaved. So here we go. Are you thinking? Are you going with me on the journey? Let's move through it quickly. Okay. I've already captured some of that for you. The British settlers that settled in Barbados in 1627. The workforce, indentured servants, and I explained who they were, enslaved Africans, and the Native American tribes. Now, let me stop here and kind of give you a little bit of backdrop on this. When the British settled Barbados, they didn't find any Native people there because they had already moved on. But do you know, during the, 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 the uh, development of Barbados, when Barbados became so big and became so prosperous, some of those who were brought or who came to the Carolinas enslaved people along the eastern coast, some of the native tribes, and took them back to Barbados. So here you have that cross-pollination. That's a bit of history that was actually documented. So we can talk about that another time. So they were taking enslaved people from along the western coast, the Atlantic coast, and taking them to Barbados, those British settlers. OK, so a similar thing. When they say that Barbados is a colony of a colony, when they say that Barbados was the culture hearth of the Western Hemisphere, when they say that the relationship between Barbados and, Car uh, and Carolina was so, so tightly woven together, it's because the same pattern, whatever was done in Barbados and pretty much succeeded, it was implemented here in the Carolinas. So you have a similar scenario playing out. 1627 in Barbados, Barbados is settled, sugar became supreme, it made the British extremely rich, and it gave the Barbadian settlers, the planters, a lot of clout. They were able to call the shots in many, many respects in England because they were pouring so much money into the British coffers that the British government, the parliament, listened to them. And in 1670, when they came here, whatever worked in Barbados, they transplanted. And so the system became so similar that many historians look back on it and say that the Carolinas resembled more a Caribbean colony than any of the colonies that were on the mainland, like those up north. The people. We're going to focus a little bit on the people because the people are very important. So here come me and meet some of the people who we are talking about. Do you know the Ashley and the Cooper rivers? They are dominant here in the south, in this area. Everything is measured in terms of the Ashley and the Cooper. Well, Sir Anthony Cooper was one of the proprietors. They had eight proprietors. And they were the speculators. Those were the ones who were looking for land and who were exploring land. Sir Anthony Cooper was the youngster. Sir John Colleton was the old man. It was, he was the, the, the head of the syndicate, let's call him. He was the one who thought up, huh, land is running scarce in, 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 in Barbados. They'd moved to, moved to some of the other islands and fought against the Spanish uh, for dominance. Barbados settled, uh, they settled Barbados in 1625 and the English stayed there. 
even though the other co uh, colonial powers were fighting for colonies and for islands, Barbados was protected because of where it was situated geographically. And so they were able to make mistakes and they were able to construct a system, a societal system that was transportable to other Caribbean islands. Now, I had mentioned earlier that people used to say, where you came from, uh, Jamaica? Well, Barbados was settled in 1627. Jamaica became English in 1655. And it was taken back from the Spanish. So Bar Jamaica was much bigger, but Barbados was the hub. That was the center where people moved to other islands. So we talked a little bit about Anthony Cooper. Uh, Anthony Cooper's family had ties to plantations in Barbados. So Anthony Cooper, his, I think it was his maternal side, but um, to be specific, don't bank on, on, on that. He did have familial ties to Barbados. Thomas and Anne Drayton. Who knows Drayton Hall? Everybody knows Drayton Hall. I mean, <laughs> that's one of the places that people go. The Draytons had plantation in Barbados. They are Draytons in Barbados. Many of them are of African descent. Now we can get off on a tangent and develop why is that so. But Drayton, the plantation that they had in Barbados was part of a bigger network of plantations owned by a, a, a gentleman called Lascelles. And Drayton had a small plantation. Now all of the plantations in Barbados weren't huge. What we found out as sugar became more dominant and they needed more land, the big planters bought out the smaller planters and they, can, they, 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 they pretty much enlarged their holdings and the smaller planters were left then to kind of, you know, do as much as they can, but they couldn't do much because they didn't have much land. But Drayton would have been one of those smaller planters. He wasn't one of the big planters. Okay, John Colleton, we have Colleton County. And here, if you go back to Barbados, there's still some of the Colleton plantations which have been uh, repurposed, uh, reused. One of the major ones is a super, super duper high-end uh, hotel. Everybody can go there. I mean, it's that super. But there were about five of them in Barbados. Uh, their plantations, some are still, them, uh, still there. Some of them, are, uh, one or two, still in disrepair. But those are evidences of the connection. Robert Gibbs and Miss Gibbs, uh, it's, it's interesting because if you go back to Barbados, there's a whole community, a seaside community called Gibbs St. Peter's. And they still have a great house there. But what about Robert Gibbs? When he came to Charleston, he was one of the leading founders. His impact on the settlement of the Carolinas was so great that today, if you were to go down to Washington Park, right by City Hall, right behind the Historical Society, there is a plaque in the corner that is designated to the Rob, Mr. Robert Gibbs, Barbadian. It's there. And so when we look at his history in the Carolinas, he was one of those fierce people. Their concept of how to govern and the tools that they used to govern were very, very harsh. But here is a connection to the Gibbs. And then we also have the Gibbs Museum. So that's another link that people probably overlook. John Ladson, who knows of Ladson? Right up here, Ladson. John Ladson actually came from Barbados. Uh, 
they were English people, yes. But back then, to say you were Barbadian, man, that meant that you were sitting good. Because this was voiced abroad to be as rich as a West Indian planter. That meant that you were where the money was and you were where things were happening. So John Latson, he probably didn't have much land in Barbados, could very well have been a, a, a small planter. But when he came to the Carolinas, he actually has a whole community name after him. And I look back at some of his deeds and, 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 and so forth, and he had at one time 1,200 slaves. That's the kind of situation that developed. Edward and Arthur Middleton, they were brothers. They owned a plantation in Barbados also. And that plantation is very, very important because now scholars are going back and they're finding some very interesting things that they didn't know before about the enslaved community. The plantation in Barbados is in a, a, a parish called St. George. And the name of the parish, or the name of the plantation was called the Mount. I grew up in Bar I was born in Barbados, I grew up some in Barbados. But I never knew of that. But I went back recently and one of our tour guides took us to, to, to uh, some of the places that have connections. On that plantation, it pretty much has a community around the plantation, which they call like tenant trees. So people would work on the plantation and they would live in these communities. But what happened is that you had um, people now going back, scholars, looking for how did the enslaved people live? What, what occurred there? And a lot of the, 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 the uh, place has not been disturbed. One of the things that they found out was the, the Middletons, I mean the, the, the Middletons who actually traveled and came here, they were experimenting with the architecture. What sort of architecture really should be in this hot place? Because when we first came to Barbados, one of the major plantations that still exists called Nicholas Abbey, and you would see a big chimney. <laughs> it's almost like a chimney in Barbados, but they were borrowing from what they knew, the Georgian type of architecture. So here you have uh, the Middletons, and there's more to it, but I can't give, give that to you right now. But the Middletons, and what we have here, the Middletons own some of the plantations in this Goose Creek area. We have the oaks and the crow field and all of those, those are the plantations that some of the Middletons from Barbados owned. Yes, we know of Middleton Place, but this was just so immense. Another character that stands out, and he pertains, uh, reaches in this area, John Yeaman. Who knows Yeaman Hall Road? Okay, you know Yeaman Hall Road? Okay, that's a gated community. You can't go up there unless somebody invites you, right? John Yeaman owned one of the plantations that still exists in Barbados that is called Nicholas Abbey. That plantation is there. And John Yeaman became one of the first governors of South Carolina. More history to that, but I'm going to speed on. I'm setting a picture for you that the connection between Barbados and the Caribbean was just immense. It was immense. Uh, they were linked together in so many areas. All of those influences were linked. From, Jama uh, from Antigua, one of the other islands, we had the Pickneys, Eliza Pickney and the in Indigo. That's a connection. A connection with a family from Jamaica in the Johns Island area. There's Fenwick Hall, he came from Jamaica. Have you heard of Parkers and the Hayes? They came from both Barbados and Jamaica. The people, these are the people who owned the properties. Uh, we look back now and they're just names, but ancestors and descend, uh, our ancestors were 
part of this whole development, and it's interesting now as we do research, if you want to find out your genealogy, one of the things that you need to find out, which plantation did your ancestors live? That's one of the places you have to go. From here, if you want to know what the connection is, you have to start from the present and work your way back to the past. And you will get to a place, where did my great, great grandmother, uh, which plantation did she serve on? Or, or did they, were, were they enslaved? Who enslaved them? You see the connections of the names? You have to go back and go places where your ancestors, they were happy to get away from. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to get back. The, you know, they were happy when they escaped that. But today, if you want to find out your genealogy, you have to go back those places. And what do you have to go back? St stick your chest out. And go back, not ashamed, but taking the moment and going and finding out and confronting that situation and learning about that situation, learning what happened. You are seizing the moment today. And I know and I've heard many uh, people of African descent in this area, oh, I don't want to go to a plantation. I don't want to hear about plantations. I could understand the pain that is wrapped up in that. I could understand why not. But you know what? I can also understand if you throw your back your chest out and you go back and you invade those spaces and you claim those spaces in the name of your ancestors, you have overcome mentally and it's something we have to do. Let's move on. The Goose Creek men. Now these are some winners. The Goose Creek men, all of this area was named after a group, a big group, a syndicate of men who actually set the stage for the development of the societal uh, Carolina. And what they have learned, what they learn in Barbados, that is what they have reproduced here. So all of these areas, they had big plantations along the Ashley but they had plantations here. These were like their country homes. So you come up the Ashley, and yes, there are certain, the big major plantations, Drayton Hall, Magnolia, and Middleton along the Ashley. But then all the way up here, up inland, you have their country homes. And we listed some of the, 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 the uh, plantations that you, you would find. Uh, all of them, I asked a question, where did they come from? Many of them came from Barbados. Not all of them came from Barbados. Some of them came from some of the other British Caribbean islands. But because Barbados was the hub, it was the headquarters of the British, particularly as it dealt with agricultural society, uh, plantations and, and work on the plantations and dividing up into gangs or, or in, in, into to, uh, the groupings to carry out the work. So these people would have come from different places. The Bahamas was part of that exchange because at a certain point you had, at a certain point you had people from here being sent to, uh, to the Bahamas. So the impact that they had on the Carolina was profound, and we still see and feel some of the, the, the aspects of it. They had that much power in the new settlement because they had experience. Once they had established colonies in the Caribbean, and in particular as the head, uh, Barbados as the headquarters, they knew it all. So when they came here, nobody could tell them anything. And they be, became arrogant. They became very, very self-assured. And they, create, they created a whole lot of disturbances. 
the former, the former uh, mayor of Goose Creek wrote two volumes called Goose Creek. It is a resource book. Goose Creek, a definitive history. And every year in this, it's a whole chronicle of the Barbadians who settled uh, and the influence that they had. Now, I always picture this because it is astounding. It's mind boggling. Barbados, 166 square miles. These planters, when they came and they landed in the Carolinas, when they looked around, all they saw was land. I mean, it was mesmerizing, I could imagine. And so they started getting lots of this land because they were, they, 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 they were, they were uh, very fit. Uh, they were the, the, those who, who, who aligned themselves with the plantation owner, with uh, the king. Uh, they, 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 were, they were recompensed for their allegiance and their alliances. And so they actually got land grants. Now what these land grants were? Hundreds and thousands of acres. There were certain specified guidelines but these people, the Goose Creek men and all those who said, got so much land that they didn't know what to do with it. And when they came and they found out that, gosh, sugar wouldn't do too good here. It's temperate. Hmm. What else should we try? Then they found out rice. And so when they came in 1670, they experimented with other crops, but it was when they realized that rice will be the crop or rice will be the sugar that Barbados had, then they started getting people en masse from West Africa. So note those years of differences. The blacks that they brought with them at first were from Barbados and the Caribbean. So that provides backdrop for some of the, the, the research that you would do when you're doing your genealogy. But then the Gullah Geechee people who were shipped in mass, it would have been like in the, uh, 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 in the 1710, 1720 uh, area when rice became the commodity that they were looking at as bringing in the kind of money to make them rich that made South, uh, the Carolinas, South Carolina very rich. It was then that they started bringing in, again from the same region of Africa, people to work on the plantation societies uh, here, this time with rice. And early o'clock, just like in Barbados, in Barbados, when they started getting the enslaved people, they actually found out that the numbers increased and that the blacks outnumbered the whites. And the same thing here in South Carolina. Your genealogy, I hope you'd be able to reflect and go back at some of the backdrops that I'm, I've, I've just given you. Couldn't go into details on it. Uh, you look at plantations, and you look at the owners, you look at the parishes, and you look at the counties. Surnames, very important. The historic events, dates of wars and uh, censuses. Those are the things that you look for in tapping into your roots. And always, always, always start in the present and move to the past. And uh, our Gullah Geechee Heritage Commission ha has uh, uh, experts who can take you through that process. But this provides the backdrop. And so I've gone over, but I hope I've painted a picture for you take away from what I've said. When you have to do your research, remember, remember that your ancestors occupied the spaces of those plantations. And even though, even though you don't have monuments and, and, and plantations that, 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 that have your names on it, 
your ancestors occupied those spaces. So go in boldly and go in and reclaim some of what was lost during that period. I just want to say one more thing in two seconds. Mm -hmm. Don't be too perturbed or taken aback. If you see a name, like for example, just what you saw Gibson, mm -hmm. G I W B E S, that does not mean that your your ancestors were not G I W B S. Because it's like what's in a name, sometimes you see brown with the E, mm -hmm. with the E or without the E. Mm -hmm. And what has happened that back in those days the E didn't make a difference, That's not right. the S. Mm -hmm. But now it makes a difference because I mean we are we have come a long way. But many of our ancestors carry a name without the S or a name with the E. Mm -hmm. So if you come over to Barbados and you want to go to the archives, mm -hmm. you are free to come to the archives and do all the research. And you can go right through the things that you have and, and you can follow it because the dates are what are important for you, will be important to you. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, CG. Questions, yes? You actually have more time than you. I have more time? Well, you know you shouldn't tell me that. <laughs> we welcome the room. The cult is welcome. Well, I'm going to open this up for questions because sometimes you learn a whole lot more by the questions that you have. So I'm going to let you ask questions, and I'm going to answer if the CG or if Robert, my husband, you know, ha have an answer. Uh, let this be question and answer time. And I hope you ask some questions because that's how you learn or you get a better understanding of the connections. Yes, Miss. Uh, <laughs> Could you give an example of where people might go, I guess, downtown or in the street to see examples of the similarities in architecture? I, I can say, ask that one quickly for you. If you come to Barbados, <laughs> when you come back, you will, you will be amazed. Uh, yesterday, I drove in with, with this family here with my honorary consul and husband. I mean, there was going down a street that I saw a very old rickety house unpainted with an old little patio. I, I, I thought that I actually lifted that from Barbados. <laughs> All the wooden houses, the shapes of the houses. I, it's like Barbados has been imported or exported from Barbados and imported to, to South Carolina. The, the, the architecture, the shape of the houses, I mean, it's unbelievable. The fact that you use even more wood in Barbados is called the chattel house. Um, here, uh, and the chattel simply meant that it could have been moved, especially back in the days with the slaves where they were moving from plantation to plantation. Um, but the houses are all almost similar. The shapes, the sizes. You have some bigger ones because you guys have more money than we have down there. But uh, that's, that's where it is. The architecture is, is just almost and as far as it pertains to the Goose Creek area, one of the things that we know, Goose Creek would have been the rural part of the settlement. So you, wouldn't, you, you, you would see the similarities in the big great houses, the plantation houses, let, yeah. let's say like Crowfield and, and the Oaks and what have you. I mean, some of them are demolished at this point, but you would see some of the architectural features. One of the things that you would find that was prominent in Barbados, like the jealousies, uh, the, 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 that was something where you can raise the jealousies or you can lower the je jealousies. Uh, you know, the, the, the veranda or, or, or the porches, those were features. So you would find them here in the, you know, the, 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 the wealthier or, or the, the houses that, that, that people had more money. And, um, the way they, they, they protected themselves, even in some of the churches. We have uh, St. James Parish in Barbados, and we have an Anglican church called the St. James Anglican Church. Here in the Goose Creek area, area you have St. James Anglican Church. Also, you look at the graveyards and you see some of the similar names, but we went inside of that. That's not open for worship all the time, but some of the, 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 the way they... they the pews and, and, and the set. The, the interesting thing about the, the British, they didn't reinvent the wheel every time they went to a new place. What they did, they transported and they left their names as signatures to the fact that they were there. 
So hundreds of years after, you can still see an English name. That's why these names live on, because it says the English were here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you come to Barbados, there's a place called Gunhead. Mm -hmm. Right, a big, you can probably Google it on the internet as well. A big, a big stone lion. And that lion was there 300 years, and the English have left all the names of the guys who were around at the time. It's still there. Mm -hmm. and they have left a mark where they left. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am? Um, you had a source this slide just about how we can remove communication and mm -hmm. use surnames to really track our genealogy. But of course, a lot of enslaved people didn't, didn't really have written history all the time. Mm -hmm. So are there sort of oral histories or maybe other sources that weren't written down that we can use to help track our genealogy? Well, you know, it's unfortunate and this was something that I can tell you from Barbados. The older people didn't like to talk, so they didn't share a lot of information. That is something new that has evolved, where people are now telling, talk to your grandparents and talk to, to, to cousins. So yes, there is a, a lack of information in terms of, of, of uh, even some of the oral stories. Some people did a good job in passing on the stories. But just as a, a, for the utility of, 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 of uh, running this society, you look back at military records, you look back at, at, at some of those sorts of governmental types of documents uh, where they, they were, uh, you can get a lot of information there. So, you look and you see, okay, this plantation was owned by this person. And how many people he had on the plantation? What are the names? So it's a bit more tedious. But in terms of making the links, if you have oral stories that your ancestors tell, uh, told and handed down, and, and you know, um, Tony Carrier knows a whole lot more about that. That's uh, an area that I'm not that familiar with. But yes, oral stories are important, and we probably have that vacuum. But there are ways to kind of get beyond that. Could I just, this is something that you encounter also. I think two years ago we were in Barbados and we had a genealogy conference. And this uh, genealogist at that time, she would get the people to go to the phone book after the lecture and find out you know, the names and call the people and find connections. Well, this lady that was with us, uh, all in the group, they went and called his family. And uh, in said, sure, come, you know, and you, you talk, found out that they were first cousins. Wow. Or that the guy that was, she was living there with married to this lady, and they were first cousins and didn't know it. Wow. 40 years they were married. <laughs> but the thing is, they never had children. <laughs> that, that, is, that is something that happens. Okay. That's right. Yes, ma'am? So I'm from the Bahamas. OK. And so I was very interested when you mentioned the Bahamas. But yes. I'm wondering, I don't see my name over here. And I'm wondering whether, um, is, was it uh, traditional that uh, people in the Bahamas, or in Barbados, would go to the Bahamas? Or did most of the people from uh, the Bahamas come through Bermuda and the Carolinas back the other way? Um, the, 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 we did, we did say that Barbados became the hub. Early on in the settlement, the Bahamas and Bermuda, they were part of the, 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 the island hopping, if you will. So there was this kind of movement between the islands to a certain degree because planters would be stationed in Barbados and they will probably go to other places. Uh, Bahamas uh, would have been a, a, a bit earlier than Barbados, but they, they really didn't, it didn't take off. It didn't really become the hub. Barbados became the hub. Bermuda, you would find some of the same um, dimensions. The interesting thing about the Bahamas, because of where it's situated, it was closer to the mainland uh, US or, or South Carolina coast, and many enslaved people were then sent back 
uh, sent to Jam uh, to the Bahamas. So th there's that kind of reverse connection. Um, the the the, the um, Barbados, because it was tucked away out in the East Coast, actually in the Atlantic, it just became so sheltered and it, it, it became kind of separate to develop, unlike some of the others that were, were always being bombarded by the Spanish and the pirates and that sort of thing. So it kind of developed a bit differently. But the interaction and the movement of yeah, peoples Barbados were pretty much. So the British were there to stay, and they had a large fort. Yeah. Actually, the largest collection of cannons. Yes, is in Barbados. Cannons is in Barbados. Yeah, worldwide, in the world. In the world. In the world. In the world. Okay, so yeah. they really prize that little island. And see, uh, again, the configuration of these islands, the, the Bahamas, you know, th th there's tiny islands, just a whole lot of little yeah. islands. Yeah. It will be kind of hard to, to, to guard all of them. So it was kind of a little bit more loose. They were the headquarters for the pirates, though, because there were a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, 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 the pirates would hide out in the, in, in the caves and the islands and uh, in the little islands in, in Barbados, in, in the Bahamas. So many things contributed to why the islands developed the way they did. And, uh, Oh yes, oh yes. Actually, there is a Creole link in Barbados, well it's in the Caribbean, where anyway, particularly in the British Caribbean uh, uh, former colonies, the Creole link would kind of send you to different places. Uh, Barbados maintains the best records, all Barbados archives. So you can get that information from the Barbados archive, but the Creole link kind of We'll, we'll, we'll touch bases on things that you wouldn't see uh, normally. So going to the Creole link is a good, is a good place to start. Uh, you Google it, um, Caribbean uh, Creole links is, is, is the name of, of, the, uh, of the website and it'll kind of give you kind of a general thing. And then these are all headquartered or in England. England is still the repository of a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. So Yes, the islands have some, but if, it were, if, if the islands were a British colony, now England is pretty much, or some of the universities there, uh, really sharing the information that was probably even held or withheld from some of the... Uh, the other thing is, if many people, um, Laura outlined early, earlier in her presentation, um, the actual location of Barbados mm -hmm. compared to the other islands of the Caribbean, where the islands that are on the chain, like she said, from just okay. off the coast of the US all the way down to South, South America. To South America, Barbados is nowhere along that chain. Mm -hmm. You see, Barbados is way in the Atlantic Ocean all by itself. Um, this side of Barbados. The Atlantic side of Barbados. Mm -hmm. And if you were to come to Barbados, you will notice that along here is practically where all the plantations are mm -hmm. St. John, mm -hmm. St. Joseph, St. Andrew, St. Peter, all along the coast. And, and it is believed as well that many of the slaves landed on this side of the country. There's a huge beach down there called Bath along St. John, and all the plantations, if you go to St. John Parish mm -hmm. Church, you will see how many of the plantation owners from the yeah. 18th and 17th century are buried in the St. John Parish Church because all the activity is more on that side of the country, while the British tongue is on this side. Now this is considered to be the nearest point across the Atlantic Ocean to the African coastline. So when they left Africa, and came across the Atlantic, the first country they had come to in the Caribbean was Barbados. Mm -hmm. And that's why probably it became such a very important um, port for them to 
because this is where they would come um, and land first in the Caribbean coming from Africa. Yes. Okay. And you, can, you can even look at the map of the Caribbean here, the map of the world, and you see where Barbados is compared to the other Caribbean islands um, way out, way out in the Atlantic all by itself. Uh, let, 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 let me tell you, I have uh, the foundation, we have some, uh, a book, a good, I mean a beautiful copy table book, it's entitled The Barbados and the Carolinas, uh, The Barbados Carolina Connection. It kind of has, it, it, the book has some highlights of places in Barbados where there are corresponding places owned by some of the same people. So it is a, 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 a easy read, uh, if, if you like history, great pictures. Uh, I, I didn't write the book, I wrote the foreword uh, because the history has become so much, I mean, it's like, it's everywhere and I can't escape it, escape it. But this book, you can purchase one for $25 if you're interested. If not, you can contact me. I have some cards, uh, the foundation, a website. You can contact me via the website, uh, the, the, the page and find out information. And here's something else. On Monday, we are meeting at the main library. The Consul General will be there presenting a little bit of information about Barbados and actually interfacing with historic groups, people who are interested in learning more about the history, but also being connected in terms of doing collaboration and what have you. So spread the word. Let people know and you're welcome to come and, 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 and uh, join us. It's going to be from 10 to 12 on Monday. I know everybody, uh, it's a work week and people have to work, but some people get off on Monday. So, uh, you know, tell, tell, you know t tell your friends and come and hear because this is probably going to be the, 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 the main uh, feature where you see how people are interested and in what they want to know. And we'll be addressing some of those issues. Well, thank you. Thank you.